Well, if you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the ninth chapter of the book of Nehemiah, an Old Testament book that is really centered upon the restoration, the rebuilding, and the reviving of God's people in that holy city of Jerusalem. And we've kind of given a theme or a topic or a title or a focus or a big idea to the scope of this work known as Nehemiah. And that theme is centered upon, rhymes with Jesus and starts with a J, Jesus. Every book, every chapter, every verse points to Jesus. And in this work, in its entirety, if you just look at it in a sliver, you may go, how, how, how do I see that? But in its entirety, if you look at Nehemiah, you'll, you'll see very clearly that, that Jesus is that good leader. Jesus is that one who can restore. Jesus is the one who can take that which has become ash and turn it into beauty. Like was mentioned before, that Jesus can take broken things, those that are lost, and make them found, those that are blind and bring them sight, those that are dead and bring them to life. That's why we've gathered this morning. You know, I, I, I think I resonate with you in that sense that I don't really have time or interest for a gathering that is a religious Like, you know, you know, like a religious thing that I do because I live in the South. I don't have time for that. Um, I have no interest in that. I have no value in that. However, to gather with people who are loving God, seeking to learn so they can know how to live, Desiring to gather so they can be encouraged and reminded that, hey, I'm not alone in this journey with Jesus. Look around me. I've got brothers and sisters who are walking this through in their own path and in their own way and running their own race, but empowered by the same grace that I am. I've got all the time in the world for gatherings such as these, where we're learning to live, where we're connecting, where we're reorienting our minds to engage in this area as missionaries, even though there's distractions all around, we can still engage. And last time we were in the book of Nehemiah, we witnessed kind of a, I would say this, like a restorative pivot in the book. And what was that? It, well, it was a return to the understanding and a heart and a hunger for God's word. Chapter 8, we see a return to the people of God coming under the authority of the Word of God. May I have your attention? May I, may I see your eyes, the white of your eyes? The day that you realize that authority is your friend, and the day that you recognize that that authority must be God's Word, is the day that you finally start learning how to move forward. Because when there is the authority of you compared to the authority of him and her and his and theirs, we call that anarchy. We call that the days of Noah when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And Jesus said, you can tell when the last days are coming. Here's a, here's a tendency. Everyone will do what's right by them. They'll, they'll, they'll believe their truth. They'll live what they feel. Yet the day when you realize, I don't know nothing. I need the authority of God's word. I need the people of God to encourage. And I need to be set aright. You will experience what they experienced in Nehemiah chapter 8. What did they experience? It rhymes with revival, but it starts with an L. What did they experience? Revival. Revival. And you go, oh, that's a church word, right? 
Isn't that that thing that they used to do 100 years ago at churches, like two weeks of revival? You know, the dictionary defines revival as an improvement in the condition or strength of something. Ever been in an automobile accident and needed to kind of improve or strengthen a certain portion of your body so that it would repair? That's reviving. Ever woken up and going, ooh, it's time for some revival here, you know? Toothbrush, toothpaste, mouthwash, whatever needs to happen. You know, it's not that mystical revival. It's not this thing like, oh, let's just, when God wants to do it, I guess. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know why he's holding back. Hmm. I don't know about that. Talk to me about your attitude, your belief, your choices, your decision, your experiences, your friends, your habits, your interests, where you go. Maybe if we aligned who we were under the authority of God's word, maybe revival wouldn't seem so mystical. Maybe it would be this thing like, man, I can kind of like walk in that improvement, strengthening, awakening daily. I can have living water that seems to kind of come up every day because I, I'm anything. I just know where to find it. That's why I go there with my attitude. I go there with my choices. I go there with my investments. I go there with my interests. And I find living water. And it's not tricky or hard to find. It's right there. In response to revival this morning, we'll see in Nehemiah chapter 9, the longest prayer ever recorded in the Bible. And here's what it does. I'm an alliteration guy, so here's what I think anyway. It reviews the history of Israel. This prayer reveals the faithfulness of God in juxtaposition to the faithlessness of all human beings. And it reorients us to some of the purposes, priorities, and truly the profit of prayer. That's a lot of alliteration right there. But it's true. That's what this prayer does for us. In fact, there's two other prayers in the Old Testament of the people of God. I think it's Daniel 9 and Ezra 2. Don't quote that. Don't Siri that. I'm not sure, but it's somewhere around there. But these prayers are important. Let me share with you three things this morning. If I had to give a title to our time together, I would call it this. Greatness, goodness, and grace. Greatness, goodness, and grace. Just to kind of pair with last week's gather, group, go, I figured let's just keep that G thing rolling. But I also love that this resource, if you haven't yet picked up a copy of this, this is the outline that Warren Wearsby suggests for chapter 9. And many of you, dozens of you, are in sermon-based connect groups. And you know that this resource provides application questions for some of the content that we consider on a Sunday morning. So that when we're in a gathering, we're hearing the Word of God preached. When we're in a group, we're able to discuss and kind of sink our teeth a little bit deeper into the application of how to live this out. Well, in efforts to kind of swim in that same stream this morning, I'd like to follow the same outline that old W.W. recommends for chapter 9. So here's how we'll spend our next 31 minutes, verses 1 through 6. We're going to consider the greatness of God. Then there's going to be a calisthenic with this next section, so be prepared. Verse 7 through 30, the goodness of God. And then lastly, verse 31 through 38, the grace of God. Greatness, goodness, and grace. If you're in Nehemiah chapter 1, I'd like to look at verses 1 through 6 and just read it to you. I'm going to butcher the names. Like, Nehemiah is not necessarily the book, like, where you find the best baby names, you know? So, like, it's not really a thing there. But, like, these names are mentioned as, like, an honor roll. These men are worthy of honor because they honored God. So, I'll do my best to pronounce them. But... Verses 1 through 6 in Nehemiah chapter 9, if you're there and you're still awake 10 minutes in, let me know by saying Jesus rebuilds and restores. Jesus rebuilds and restores. Okay, verse 1, this is what it says out of the New Living Translation. On October 31st, the people assembled again. 
And this time, they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. It's a whole new scene than what chapter 8 had to talk about. There was jubilation in chapter 8. Now there's, you know, sackcloth. Interesting. Verse 2. Well, those of the Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They, listen to this, they remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud. Then, for three hours more, they confessed their sins and worshiped their God in lazy boys. No, it doesn't say, I don't know what they did. It doesn't give us specificity whether they're standing, kneeling, face down, whatever. But there's this sense of they're engaged. Like God's word is being read, they're standing for three hours. You thought Lord of the Rings was long with popcorn and drinks and like a cushiony seat. They're standing there listening to the word of God read for three hours. And then for three hours more, they're responding, worshiping. Verse 4, it, it names some of these individuals. Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shabani, Bunny. Or Bani, maybe? I don't like Bunny. Anyway. Sherbi, Bani, Kenai, stood on the stairway of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud voices. And the leaders of the Levites, some more of their friends right there, called out to the people, stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives. He lives. From everlasting to everlasting, then they prayed, may your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You, you, Preserve them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. Feasting has turned to fasting in chapter 9. They approached God with humility. Fasting, burlap, dust on their heads. This was an outward display of an inward reality in their hearts. And listen, as a Christian, that's the way it always is. You begin to display outwardly that which is inwardly. That which is private exudes publicly. It's just the way it goes. They approached God with humility. They obeyed God, listen, with singularity. What do you mean? It says there that they separated themselves from the world. Did you know that that's what the church definition is? Those that are called out, separated unto Christ from the world. Like Christianity, by definition, looks different than a life that's led by the flesh, the world, and the devil. It looks different. Different values, different agenda, different goals, different measures of success and health. Totally different. They talked to God truthfully. What do you mean? They confessed. Now, this is not written in the Greek language, but in the New Testament, the word for confession is the word homo legea. You know what homo means? Same. Legea means to speak. This is what true confession is. If you call it sin, so do I. If you call this good, so do I. I speak the same thing you speak, God. And if you say lust in the heart is adultery, then I'm an adulteress. If you say hate in your heart is murder, I'm a murderer. I agree with you, God. What you say is what I say. That's what I say. They worshiped God genuinely. What do you mean genuinely? Three hours. Man, it's hard to get people to listen to 20 minutes of podcasting with like good, you know, stories about bunny rabbits and things. And like, he just read the Bible for three hours. And it's like the book of the law. If it, like, when's the last time you read, like, Leviticus? Like, I'm going to stand and listen to this. This is awesome. Like, that's what's happening here. They worshiped God genuinely, listening, 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 and then responding, responding, responding. For six hours this happened. 
They obeyed, listen, this is gnarly. I mean, they obeyed their leadership joyfully. Said that they gathered under the Levites. They recognized the enemy is the author of confusion. God likes things to be done decently and in order. That's one of the great things I love about the American military. You men and women that have served and do serve have a tremendous respect and understanding for authority. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. They acknowledged God truthfully. You could preach a whole sermon on this statement, but look at this prayer that they pray here in these first few verses. They speak truthfully about God. Well, what's the truth? He lives forever. Do you? Yes, but we had a beginning. Does he? No. Who's got more perspective? Uh, The one who's always existed. He lives forever. Okay. His name is glorious. The name represents the character of the person. He is above every other praise. He's bigger than LeBron, if you want to look at it that way, you know? He's the creator. He's the sustainer. And all of heaven worships him. So much could be said here about the greatness of God, but let me just share two things. Remember who you're talking to when you're frustrated in prayer. Remember his position. Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is not your servant. He does not exist to make sure you've got a comfortable life. That's not why God exists for you. He is not your homeboy, nor is he the unknowable one. These are kind of the two different polar opposites here. He's the creator who became incarnated. That's who he is. He is above and beyond, and he is also accessible and knowable. Take a second and look at the stars on a clear night, if you can find one in April and May in the Northwest Florida area. Or make the drive between Pensacola Beach and Navarre on that national seashore. And understand, he's got this under control. Look at what he can do. He can create stuff like this. It's going to be okay. Get on Google or Instagram and look up ocean creatures. My wife, she follows all these like ocean things on her little Instagram feed. So she'll be like, look at this fish. It's got like lips like, like why do you look at all this stuff? Like she's just always looking at unique creation. And, it, and as I look at it, I go, man, okay. But creation is complex. It, it shows us that like God's so much bigger than you think he is. There's so many things we have yet to still discover on the ocean floor. And God says, this has been here for millennia. I can take care of your prodigal daughter. I can take care of that challenging business endeavor. I can provide for you. I want you to trust me. Remember who you're talking to when you pray. He's not your homeboy, but he's also not the unknowable. He's the creator who became incarnate. He's God. But also remember his character and his capability. What do you mean? He preserves. He's all powerful. A God this big can handle all of my small, and a God this good can be trusted with all my goods. That's the way I look at that. A God this good, anything I have. (laughs) You you do a lot better job. Just tell me what to do. Show me how to steward this relationship, this resource, this agenda, whatever it is. I don't know. You just tell me what to do. I want to homo I want to speak what you speak. Just show me. Now, here's what I find interesting, and this is where some calisthenics will be involved. And I'm not going to talk about jumping jacks or push-ups or things like that. But verses 7 through 30, super long. Lots, Lots being said there. So this is what I thought. Let's do what they did while I read this prayer. Say, what do you mean? Six hours? No. 
It's going to take about six and a half minutes, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me as I read verses 7 through 30 from the New Living Translation, and here's the theme that I want you to grasp from this reading. Now, I know for some of us, this is like, wow, this is asking a lot. I understand that. I understand that. But if you're physically able and you're so inclined, I'd love to invite you to stand as I read verses 7 through 30 and remember the theme, the goodness of God. Listen to what is said to God in this moment. Verse 7, you are the Lord God who chose Abram, brought him from the Ur of Chaldeans, and renamed him Abraham. When he had proved himself faithful, you made a covenant with him to give him and his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. And you have done what you promised, for you are always true to your word. You saw the misery of our ancestors in Egypt, and you heard their cries from beside the Red Sea. You displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all his people. For you knew how arrogantly they were treating our ancestors. You have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You divided the sea for your people so they could walk through on dry land, and then you hurled their enemies into the depths of the sea. They sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. You led our ancestors by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night so they could find their way. Verse 13, you came down from Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and instructions that were just, decrees and commands that were good. You instructed them concerning your holy Sabbath. And you commanded them through Moses, your servant, to obey all your commands, decrees, and instructions. You gave them bread from heaven when they were hungry, water from a rock when they were thirsty. You commanded them to go and take possession of the land you had sworn to give them. Verse 16, but our ancestors, well, they were proud and stubborn. They paid no attention to your commands. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles you had done for them. Instead, They became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back to their slavery in Egypt. But you're a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemies. But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of clouds still led them Forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell. Then you helped our ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations, and you placed your people on every corner of the land. They took over the land of King of Sihon of Heshbon and the King of Og of Bashan, You made their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and brought them into the land you had promised to their ancestors. They went in and took possession of the land. You subdued whole nations before them, even the Canaanites who inhabited the land. They were powerless. Your people could deal with these nations and their kings as they pleased. Our ancestors, well, they captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took over houses full of good things with cisterns already dug, vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate until they were full, grew fat, and enjoyed themselves and all your blessings. Fat and sassy. That's that YouTube right there. That's what they're doing. But despite all this, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They, 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 they killed your prophets who warned them to return to you. And they committed terrible blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies. You made them suffer. But in their time of trial or trouble, they cried to you and you heard from heaven. In your great mercy, you sent them liberators who rescued them from their enemies. But as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight. And once more, you let their enemies conquer them. Yet whenever your people turn and cry to you for help, you listen once more from heaven in your wonderful mercy. 
You rescued them many times. Verse 29, you're almost done. You warned them to return to your law, but they became proud, obstinate, and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which people will find life if they will only obey. They stubbornly turned their backs on you and refused to listen. In your love, you were patient with them for many years. You sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets, but they still wouldn't listen. So once again, you allowed the peoples of the land to conquer them. You may be seated. In this section of prayer, here's the theme. God is good, and people are people. That's the theme. God is good. You you see the faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of us all. And you also see a pattern. This is the exact same pattern that was displayed in the book of Judges seven times over. You say, what's the pattern? Well, things are good, but the people are unfaithful to God. So, they're delivered into the hands of their enemies. The people repent, and they cry out for mercy. And what happens? God sends a leader or a champion or a judge, as the word shofet in Hebrew says, The judge delivers the people of God from oppression. They prosper, and then they fall again into unfaithfulness, and the cycle is repeated over and over and over and over. And I'll be honest with you. The cycle that's described here, this is your life. If there's not an intentional approach to your walk with God. You're not going to drift towards health. You're going to drift towards unhealth. A A garden doesn't drift towards not being a garden with weeds. doesn't happen. No, I've never seen it. Unless you've got some kind of amazing spray that you're not telling anybody about. Did it once and never happened again. But the garden, it produces weeds eventually. The the car, the, the alignment of the tires, eventually needs to be aligned again. You don't drift towards health. You balance it spiritually because the source is the Spirit of God. But you're the vessel. And you've heard this before by Pastor John many times. God has a plan for your life and so does the enemy. And every single day you make a choice of which plan you're going to follow. Why is this prayer here? Listen to what John Corson says. I'm going to put it for you up on the screen. He says this. Why is this prayer recorded? I believe it is to teach us the necessity of remembering our own personal history. How long has it been since you carved out a chunk of time to reflect with the Lord about things that he's done in you, with you, and for you? I'm convinced we get shot down, depressed, discouraged, and defeated because we're always looking ahead to the next day or week and failing to look back to see what the Lord has already done in our lives. And then he says this. I thought this was interesting. When the Israelis bought the American F-16 in the 80s, they made a simple modification that saved them countless lives. They added a rearview mirror. This allowed them to see their enemies coming. I'm convinced that many of us who should be flying high are shot down because we don't have a rearview mirror on our own spiritual plane. We don't see what's behind us. We don't reflect with the Lord upon how he's blessed us or answered our prayers or seen us through over the years. If you want to get blessed and guard yourself against being shot down, he says, spend a couple hours with the Lord and look back and see what the Lord has done. So many people are frustrated in prayer, and I would say this, they don't start right. They never paid attention to the tabernacle or the temple. You say, what do you mean? Enter his courts with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I would submit to you that that's a pattern for our prayer life. What do you mean? You don't start with, 
Oh, God, it's awful. No, 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 no. You start with God. You're good. This is who you are. You're the creator. You're the sustainer. You're the rewarder. You created that weird fish that's at the bottom of the sea. Like, you're over everything. You know my end from my beginning. Look what you've done in my past. And then you look at your present, and you go, oh, well, maybe this isn't so bad. Warren Wiersbe quotes three guys that I'm going to read to you about this section. I thought it was interesting. Pearson says, history is his story. And this chapter kind of bears that out. Huxley says that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons that history has to teach. And one other individual, George, said those who do not remember the past are condemned to relive it. And I like what Wearsby says. If you're reading this commentary, you'll, you'll find it in the text this week that the church today can learn much from the experiences of Israel if we're willing to humble ourselves and receive truth. Do you know what God gives to the humble? Grace. Do you know what he does to the proud? He resists them. Is that what you want? You want the resistance of God in your life? I don't know about that. That's the guy that has all authority in heaven on earth. I don't want him to resist me. I need his assistance, not his resistance, you know? Well, how do I do that? The pathway is humility. And well, what is humility? It's seeing things accurately. That's what humility is. It's not thinking too high or too low. It's just seeing it accurately. I'm created in the image of God. I have value, dignity, and worth because of that. I'm not lower than the next person next to me. That, that's called like a false sense of humility. Oh, woe is me. Never me. Oh, you know, you know those people? And those other people are like, well, you don't have to tell him that he's, you know, pff, he knows he's good. You know, like, whew, that's, you know, arrogance. You know, you don't want that. You want to see things accurately. God is good. I am not. If you see anything good, it's God. There's the accurate view. And that doesn't make you depressed, nor does it make you impressive to others. It makes you accurate. See, here's what we need to see about this prayer recounting the goodness of God. God is good. Sin is not. <laughs> God is good. Sin is dumb. God is good. Sin is just a little bit of poop in the brownie mix. You know what I'm saying? Like you've eaten it and you'd be like, oh, just a little, no, you don't want none of that. If it's got a little bit in there, it's ruined. It's ruined. You don't want those brownies. And here's what I'm trying to say. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it will destroy you. My two-year-old doesn't get that. Dad, why can't I just run outside when the, when the trash truck is coming? On the, on the Netflix show, Trash Truck is Nice. He pulls Santa's sleigh. So I'm just going to run out there in front of him. No, you can't do that. He'll flatten you like a pancake. Leonidas, he doesn't want to hear that. I don't care if Leonidas wants to hear that. Because when a toddler is young, I don't buy into the currency of influence in our relationship. I buy into the currency of control. But when Leonidas is 22, that currency of control is over. And you better learn the exchange rate with your children or else you will have no influence in their life when they're older. They'll want nothing to do with you. Because when you're young, you think, oh, let's influence them. Honey, you should go to church. Pfft. You're going to church. You're going to eat broccoli. Like, if you're going to do stuff physically healthy, you're going to do stuff spiritually that's healthy. Deal with it. But when you're older, hey, listen. It's now time to enter into the friendship zone. I'm not there. I have a 12-year-old, a soon-to-be 10-year-old, 8-year-old, soon-to-be 6-year-old, 3-year-old, and a newborn. I'm not there. But I have watched for the last 20 years, since I started in Santa Barbara at the age of 19, parents that bought into the influence model when their kids were young, and the kids went haywire in their 20s and 30s. And then parents that had the appropriate level of respectful parenting control in that sense. And then did exchange it for influence. And now they like go to Disney World together in their 20s and 30s and they love it. 
They have a relationship. And each child is different. Each child is different. But in this situation, God knows and recognizes this sin will destroy you. You're in bondage. They cry out. He responds. He sends a champion who breaks the cycle. Can I ask you a question? Who is our great champion? Jesus. Jesus is the one that breaks that cycle. You don't have to continue to live in that same murky mire of sin that he saved you from. Jesus can restore. Jesus can rebuild. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Your spiritual problem can only be solved by Jesus Christ. Only. Your spiritual problem is the same problem that we're all born into. We are born into death and sin, separated from God with the morning's breath. It's not until the day that we recognize that God is good and realize that we are in need of His goodness and repent of our sin and receive His Spirit because of what His Son has done on the cross that our spiritual problem is solved at the cross. And then very simply, we declare that. We identify. We celebrate. We proclaim through the waters of baptism. If you're here this morning and you haven't taken those first two steps, you need to do that. Today is the day. But many of you here, I know, and you're saying, it's not so much that I need to solve my spiritual problem. God's done that. But I'm not spiritually healthy. And I would say, okay, partner with God. How do I do that? We talked about it last week. Gather with God's people regularly to make it about Him. Group together with God's people to connect and grow together. And then go and live on mission. And then next week, do that over again. Then next week, do that over again. Then next week, do that over again. And it'll get harder and harder before it gets easier. It does get easier. But you know, shin splints, you ever heard of those things? Yeah, you heard. You ever heard about that little headache in your back, when, in the head, and you're like, oh, no caffeine, no sugar. Like, oh, man, I'm dying. You know, like, no, you're not. You're, you're detoxing. That's what's happening. And you're like, you're getting healthier. Spiritually, it's those that start to move forward in like week two, week three. It's like the enemy comes back. Send the flesh and the devil. Like, oh, what's happening? I'm trying to move forward in my life. It happens in every other realm of your life, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. When you try to get healthy, there's kickback. That, wheat, that tree that you're trying to straighten out with that stick in your yard, it's going to kick back until it's going to kind of come back. It's the same thing spiritually, man. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. Don't take a good thing and make it a God thing. These are good things. Salary, status, sex, situation, sport, stuff. But when you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it robs the good thing of the good it was intended for by God. Sport is not meant to be the master passion of your life. When it's turkey season, great. You got to go every weekend. Salary, is that what it's all about? Status, stuff. Go live that way, bro. See what it does for you. Come back in 20 years. You'll be in the same spiritual infant state you're in now. And your life will have passed you by don't have to live that way. Those things only gratify, they don't satisfy. And you're not made for gratification. You've been designed for satisfaction. And satisfaction is only found in Jesus. Everything else is gravel into the Grand Canyon of your heart. It's not wrong. Sport, salary, status, in their proper place, they're awesome. In their improper place, they are a robber. And they will steal. Take your Bibles and turn with me to one other place before we wrap this up. I just got a couple more minutes, but Matthew chapter 16. I'm told that this was my, uh, my dad's older brother's favorite scripture. I don't know if that's true. I never asked him about it, but I'm told that. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 24, Jesus says something that I think is so helpful for us to seeking to balance our spiritual health. Matthew chapter 16 Starting in verse 24, I think this is really, 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 really helpful. 
because it's in red, so I know it is. Jesus says this, if anyone wants to be my follower, just go to church. No. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Are you old enough yet to kind of figure out your way? Cool, give that thing up. Here's what you need to do. Give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you're trying to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what you do, benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? How do I balance spiritual health? Daily. 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 I would say like morning, afternoon, and evening, or even hourly. And even for me, I'm not there yet. It's like minute by minute. I can't do it daily. I have to do it like minute by minute. Okay, not about Neil. Not about Neil. Not about Neil. It's daily. It's moment by moment for me. Because God truly is good. And I want to be where he is. I want to do what he's doing. I want to say what he's saying. I want to have that grace, not that resistance. And I would just say, those verses that we read while you were standing, learn from them. There's a cycle that we're all going to gravitate towards of just kind of being stuck. And you don't have to do that if you'll start dying to yourself and following him and not doing it alone, gathering with his people, grouping with his people, going with his people. Now, lastly, this morning, let's look at verses 31 through 38, and we're going to end with grace. Look at verse 31 of Nehemiah chapter 9. Back there with me, if you would, in your Bibles. The prayer records for us this language. But in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we've suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders and priests and prophets and ancestors, all of your people from the days when the kings of Assyria first triumphed over us until now. Every time you punished us, you were being just. And look at that recognition. I'm owning where we are. We've sinned greatly. You gave us what we deserved. Our kings and leaders and priests and ancestors, they did not obey your law or listen to your warnings and the commands of your laws. Even while they had their own kingdom, they didn't serve you, though you showered your goodness on them. You gave them large fertile land, but they refused to turn from their wickedness. They owned where they were. So now today, we're slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We're slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure. We're in great misery. And all the people responded. In view of all this, we're making a solemn promise and putting it in writing on this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. Grace. Why, why do you say grace here? I was talking to someone this weekend about the dynamics of their life in walking with the Lord. And there's been ups and downs and lefts and rights and backwards and forwards, like all of us. But we both came to this conclusion. If God only ever sent his son to die on the cross and rise again to take away our sin, let me have your attention. That's more than you deserve. If he never did anything else for you, you're still in the, in the black. And that's a good black. Like, oh, I'm profiting here. You know, like God's grace. See, I think we should always remember this beautiful symbol. Look at what God's done. Did you know that the book of Romans says that God demonstrated in a sense of finality his love? So many people are looking for love, right? Many in the wrong places, but they're looking for love. And the Bible says, here it is. It's been defined. It's been demonstrated. It's been shown once and for all. And this we know love, that Christ died for us. And I just, need to, I just need to share this with you. 
If that does not satisfy your soul, please listen to me. Nothing will. It's only the grace of God as evidenced in the giving of His Son that you're satisfied. And if you're not there, at least be honest with God. And just tell Him, that's not enough for me. Tell Him, He knows the intentions of your heart. Say, no, I need the salary. I need the trophy spouse. I need the big house. At least be honest with them. Read the book of Ecclesiastes while you say these things. But at least be honest. It's a good place to start, especially in church. I mean, we, we, we like honesty in church. Like, it's a good thing. But this is the thing that they did. God, we own our sin. We're right where we're supposed to be. But you need to know this. Chapter 9 is not where the story ends for you and I. You know Why? Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says this, where sin abounds, what abounds so much more? Grace, grace. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, you are saved by grace. Grace, grace. God gives His greatness, His goodness, and His grace in the person and finished work of Jesus. Jesus did not hang on that cross and say, it's almost done. He said, it's finished. The price has been paid. Did you know that for us as believers, we don't have to walk in this like burlap and ash like they did here in Nehemiah chapter 9? We walk in the joy of the Lord as our strength. We live the life of the fruit of the Spirit, where there's peace, the ability to be long-suffering, kindness, goodness, even self-control. When everything else is out of control, you can stay self-controlled because you know who's ultimately in control, and that's God. This is the life of the believer, not that sin cycle but a journey with God. Yes, there's going to be the righteous falling seven times. Yes, but there's grace. There's grace. There's grace. My encouragement to you and to me is simply as we close this morning, get real with God. God gives grace to the humble. Just come before God and just share with Him clearly. This is where I am, Lord, in my heart in my attitude, in my choices, in my mind with my marriage or my business or my church or my country or watching the news for 18 hours. I'm just going to unload on you, God. That is the book of Psalms where those writers would just say, God, I'm pouring my heart out to you. But as we close, and let me just go ahead and invite the worship team to join us as we close. Remember how this chapter is covered with proper clarity of the goodness and greatness of God. Share your heart honestly with the Lord, but also don't tell yourself lies. God's good. God's great. He's the creator. Look at the past faithfulness that he's provided in your life and let that form and fashion your honesty before him. Every single time you see David in the Psalms pouring out his heart, it's almost like he's like, no, let me think about this. He's like, oh yeah, but God's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, but God's faithful. Oh, yeah, 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 but he's never going to leave me. But I love that balance. He's free to tell the Lord, God, this is where I am. But he's also firm in the truth. Firm in the truth that God is good, God is great, God is creator, God is sustainer, God is rewarder. God can handle this. He's got you. So live in his grace, live in his mercy. Take this chapter 9 as even an instruction on how to pray. Let your prayer language be that of thanksgiving and praise before it is ever about request and petition. Church, God, God loves you to death. He proved it on the cross. He's got a journey called life that he can't wait for you to just walk with him in. 
as you stay humble before him and follow him.